What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you five games that were saved from extinction, disappearing, the void, whatever you'd like to call it. Which is a video I wanted to make following the announcement that GOG had brought Alpha Protocol back to the digital marketplace, or simply the ability to purchase it digitally. On top of bringing a host of fixes and improvements to how it ran and operated, such as support for basically every modern controller, bug fixes, the usual stuff. What makes that really special is that you could not buy Alpha Protocol online anywhere for like the last five or six years. This was due to a licensing issue with one of the songs in-game. And while you could technically buy a physical copy that comes with its own problems and limitations, as you could only grab a used copy. But in light of that news, I thought it would be fun to take a look at quite a few games that mostly GOG has in fact saved from suffering a similar fate in some manner, alongside some just extra general information about them that I thought might be fun for a video. Because whether it be GOG, the work of dedicated modders, or frankly, a little bit of both, you can, in fact, play all of these games these days with relative ease, which, as a channel that likes to cover old games that are constantly disappearing, matters to me, at the very least. So with that out of the way, let's actually dive into it, starting with, of course, Alpha Protocol. Alpha Protocol is a spy thriller that is a bizarre combination of a lot of different things. It's janky, it's weird, in many ways I would say a lot of it doesn't even work, but it had a ton of ambition, and it's branching narrative that allows you to do basically any mission in any order, leading to all sorts of different outcomes and variables that puts you on a path to a indeterminate amount of endings, no one exactly agrees on how many there are, was truly something special. Developed by Obsidian, the game was something of a cult classic before being pulled from stores over that licensing issue. Until literally just yesterday from the time of this video, where it was finally restored to a digital storefront with bug fixes, language options, controller support, basically the works. Which means if you just so happen to watch my review of this particular title and want to try it out for yourself, that should be pretty easy for you to do. Next up, though, we have Neverwinter Nights 2, an interesting one to be sure. You see, you cannot buy this game on Steam because of, again, a licensing issue. However, you can buy it on GOG. And what's more, you can actually buy a version on GOG that has all of the premium adventures. That is to say, Mask of the Betrayer, Storms of Zaheer, and Mysteries of Westgate. Which is especially notable because while you can technically buy a physical copy of Neverwinter Nights 2, none of the physical copies come with the Mysteries of Westgate. And given that the premium modules for Neverwinter Nights 2 have to have a sort of authentication for them to actually work, you can't just download the files online, though they are technically available, you might run into some issues with that. And GOG makes that a non-issue because it comes with Mysteries of Westgate. And while I would say the second entry here never quite enjoyed the first game's longevity through the user-created modules and persistent worlds, it's still an especially notable game, if only because it's one of very, very few games that actually use Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 edition, and ultimately, if it wasn't for GOG, it would be very difficult to get your hands on this title. Now, for the middle of the pack here, we then have Fable 2 and 3, really. Our one non-GOG game here, and honestly the one I don't really have any footage for, so we'll see how that goes for editing. Might just be some static images there. But Fable 2 and 3 are technically available these days, and of the games on this list, I would say they were the most readily available, period, as buying a physical copy for the Xbox 360 was always on the table. However, in the last couple of years, there's been some developments on that front. Back in, I believe it was like 2013, that Games for Windows Live shut down, and with that shutdown, playing games that used that bit of DRM suddenly became a huge hassle. Mostly for Fable 3, which actually got a PC release that had Games for Windows Live attached to it, and because that service no longer works, you cannot simply buy a PC version of Fable 3 these days physically and install it. You can get it to work, but you're going to have to do a bunch of tinkering to basically bypass that DRM. 
possible but a giant headache. And add to that that you can't buy that game anywhere digitally, and suddenly you've got a pretty big problem. However, lucky for us, this was solved to some degree a year or two back with Game Pass. Following, I believe it was the announcement of the Fable reboot, which we have yet to see materialize or really see much news at all about, Nonetheless, they added Fable 2 and 3 to Game Pass, which allows you to do things like stream it to a PC via xCloud, which means having to do things like buying expensive physical versions of an almost gone game or having to have a working Xbox 360 alongside discs that have actually survived since all of that doesn't get produced anymore is no longer such a big deal. Curiously though, Fable 1 was never included in this, because you've always been able to buy a version of Fable 1 even on just something like Steam. In fact, the anniversary edition of the original title is a great way to go, as it even cut out the online stuff, meaning that you can do everything Fable 1 had to offer, completely single player. And while it's not a perfect solution by any means, it does make both of those titles a bit more accessible than they previously were, which for a series that at one time was such a big deal is honestly pretty heartbreaking to see. Though while it's unlikely to happen, I do wish they would port uh, 2 and 3 properly back to Steam or something like that for the people who want to play and check out that series before the reboot officially launches, because while these games are accessible, it is honestly a bit of a hassle to get a hold of them. Switching it back over to GOG though, next up we then have Temple of Elemental Evil, which is an interesting title for a variety of reasons. Developed by Troika, this crawl through a mega dungeon sees you making all sorts of choices, building a party who then have their own dynamics based on your overall alignment, and an interesting take on a few D&D systems even. It's a bit of a cult classic among CRPG enthusiasts like myself, and while it's been available on GOG for some time, I think what's really noteworthy about this one is actually the collaboration between all of the modders on top of that GOG release that has made the game truly enjoy some longevity, as just the GOG version is actually not that great. It is prone to crashes, things like save file corruption that can make it a headache to play. Luckily, there's a very dedicated fan base for Temple of Elemental Evil even to this day, which brought us the Circle of Eight and Temple Plus mods. These fix the problems I just mentioned on top of adding a plethora of user-generated content, almost in the vein of like a Neverwinter Nights scenario where there's just people making it and adding it in so you can do all sorts of stuff even beyond what the base game added. So on top of just fixing it and making it more approachable and able to be ran on modern hardware, it also adds all that potential extra content for you at the same time. As it is far from just actual corporations and publishers keeping these games alive. Which brings us to our final entry and another interesting, I would say, collaboration collaboration between GOG and the passion of modders, basically, which is Icewind Dale 2, another game that you can only buy on GOG, at least digitally, but it is also a bit dated and clunky for modern machines, which is why people wanted an enhanced edition for the title like all of the other Infinity Engine games got, such as Baldur's Gate 1, 2, Planescape Torment, etc. However, for Icewind Dale 2, they could not do that because the source code was lost. Enter a very dedicated group of modders, however, and I believe it was just late last year that that fully came to fruition, and they were able to release an enhanced edition of Icewind Dale 2, completely recreated as a mod for the game, which means while you still need to buy Icewind Dale 2 from GOG, you can then mod it into an enhanced edition that adds all those other features that you've probably enjoyed if you're looking at a game like this from the other enhanced editions for the Infinity Engine, which does wonders for the accessibility and thus playability of this title, because these games aren't necessarily spring chickens by today's standard, and thus a big fight with actually playing them is simply understanding what you're doing and the system at play, which is where the enhanced editions come in, and they make that experience a ton easier, on top of just being more playable on modern machines. But in any event, that brings us to the end of our list, because whether it be 
GOG resurrecting nearly dead games or modders coming in, fixing, and providing free mods that actually allow these games to be played and enjoyed. There are people out there trying to do the work of preserving a lot of these old titles, and I thought it would be fun to draw some attention to that, because every year that goes by, you see more and more stories about how games of yesteryear are disappearing due to obsolete hardware, lack of updates, etc. Case in point, many of the games on this list saw an Xbox 360 release, but due to the aging nature of that hardware and the physical copies of the games themselves also deteriorating over time, which is to say nothing of the fact that a lot of times those physical editions don't even come with all the DLC and things that were added to the game over the course of their initial lifespan. And you see that providing these games not only just the ability to be purchased, but the ability to actually be played and enjoyed with all of the content and intention behind their original release is something of a more difficult task. So while I admittedly use Steam for most everything, I do think the work that places like GOG who aren't even focused on making a profit so much as simply preserving all these things is incredibly important work if video games actually matter to you. But with that, I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know of some other titles in a similar vein that you want to talk about. As this is far from a comprehensive list, there are plenty of games out there that you still can't buy, period, such as Too Human. But I try to focus on the positive side, I suppose. Either way, though, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.